Welcome back to Child Adolescent Sexuality. This is part two of the lecture. First we look at sexual activity in U.S. teens. Between 2011 and 2013, among 15 to 19 year olds, 44% of females and 49% of males have had sexual intercourse. Let's look at this in a little more detail. This figure is from the National Center for Health Statistics and shows never married females and males aged 15 through 19 who have ever had sexual intercourse. You can see from the trending that both in the female group and in the male group nationally there has been a slight decline in the number of 15 to 19 year olds who have ever had sexual intercourse. This is <clears throat> probably moving in the right direction, although we want to be clear that this does not mean that everyone is using condoms. This is data from the Center for Disease Control in 2007. The reason I haven't been able to update it is because Texas has not updated the information and has not necessarily collected it. But in 2007, um, the Texas students, as you can see, had 52.9% uh, ever had sexual intercourse, which is higher than the number you saw previously because the number has gone down. And in the US, um, it was 47.8. Um, Texas students were considered at equal risk and those currently sexually active, meaning those who had sexual intercourse with at least one person during the three months prior to the survey, was not statistically significant difference between Texas students and U.S. students. Um, the same is essentially true for having had intercourse with four or more persons during their life. However, those who did not use condoms during the last sexual intercourse among those students who were sexually active were higher in Texas, as you can see, the 43.6% versus U.S. students at 38.5%. So this left Texas at greater risk for our students. Now we turn our attention to sexual identity. <clears throat> the most recent data available shows that nationwide 88.8% .8 of students identified as heterosexual, 2% identified as gay or lesbian, 6% identified as bisexual, and 3.2% were not sure of their sexual identity. Let's look at the data in a little more detail. First, we need to pay attention to how we take the history in adolescence, particularly sexual history. It's important to use gender neutral language. So rather than saying, do you currently have a boyfriend or do you currently have a girlfriend? We need to use other language such as, are you currently in a romantic relationship with someone? And follow through with using gender neutral language throughout the interview. How to ask the questions is an important consideration for psychiatric mental health nurses in order to provide a safe space for the adolescent to disclose. The education and eliciting of questions is an another important component and we want to be clear that we are not here to make judgments of the adolescent and that's part of the education process. We also want to ensure confidentiality in the history taking. And finally, disclosures, if there are any, need to be explained up front before asking questions because adolescents will be concerned about who is going to be able to garner this information after you have collected it. It's really all about developing a rapport and the therapeutic relationship between the nurse practitioner and the adolescent. So let's look at the number and percentage of students by sexual, identify, uh, by sexual identity 
uh, in the United States and selected U.S. sites. And this comes from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey of 2015. This was the first time that the Youth Risk Behavior Survey asked questions about sexual orientation. So as you can see here in the U.S., this is the total number of students that were questioned about this and then that this is the percent of students who reported being gay or lesbian however interestingly this is the percent of students who reported as being bisexual and these are the students that reported being unsure when it's broken down by male and female you see that the two percent remains um, those who acknowledge being bisexual are 2.4 percent whereas females report that more often with 9.8 percent and you can see the data for those that are unsure and then because Texas did not report as a state in its entirety we have to take a look at the two major cities that were participating in this survey and what we found was a similar rate in males, 2.1%, um, or excuse me, overall 2.1%, and then a bisexual 5.6%, and unsure 4.1%. And in Houston, the numbers are a little bit different with 4.2%, and then 7% reporting to be bisexual, and 5.1% being unsure. So this is going to give you an idea about the prevalence rate for teenagers by sexual identity. Now, sex by sexual context is another interesting uh, bit of data to look at. In the United States, 48% <clears throat> um, reported having sex with opposite sex only, 1.7% same-sex only, and both sexes were 4.6%, and no, sex, no sexual contact was 45.7%. In males, we see that there's a 53.3% opposite sex only, 1.3% same-sex only, both sexes 1.9%, and this is quite different than what we see in females with a drop of 42.6% in females, 2.1% uh, same-sex only, and both sexes 7.4%, and no sexual contact 47.9. And then in Fort Worth and Houston, you can see the data reported here. So what we see is that there is an interesting trend in having in a subpopulation of sexual minority students having sex with either same sex only or with both sexes and again this is why we need to be using gender neutral language when we are talking with our teens to gather sexual history and also for health promotion purposes. Sexuality is considered a continuum and this has been the case since the Kinsey report of sexual behavior in the human male in 1948 and sexual behavior in the human female in 1953. So Kinsey's original model had a rating scale of 0 to 6 with 0 being exclu exclusively heterosexual and 6 being exclusively homosexual and then gradations in between. So, as you can see, there is some fluidity involved in human sexuality. It is not always fixed. Terminology for use in describing different populations include gay referring to male-to-male -male romantic attraction, straight referring to those self-identified at a Kinsey level of zero, lesbian referring to female-to-female -female romantic attraction, bisexual referring to romantic attraction to both genders and transsexual referring to gender identity that is contrary to the external sexual gender 
and again this refers back to the internal sense of maleness or femaleness that we discussed earlier in part one. In order to understand adolescent sexual orientation adjustment, we need to pay attention to Erickson's developmental stages. In the developmental component of fidelity, we look at identity versus role confusion in the adolescent. Who am I? How do I fit in? And parents often will accept some degree of exploration but the outcome of successful negotiation through this phase of fidelity and identity versus role confusion should result in a healthy ego identity and a continuity with the self. And that would be the goal of adolescent sexual orientation adjustment, be it gay, straight, bisexual, or other. So in gay and lesbian teen adjustment, positive identity formation has been described as four phases. The sensitization phase includes discovering same-sex feelings of attraction. Identity confusion is the reaction to the same-sex attraction, which can commonly occur. Identity assumption is discovering that one is gay or lesbian and commitment is the adoption of a gay or lesbian identity. Gay and lesbian teen adjustment is an identity formation is also confounded by social responses in discovery, disclosure, integration, and finally identity formation. Contextual considerations include social responsiveness to the teen, acceptance by family and peers, implications for the here and now, as we know adolescents are very much here and now oriented, implications for the future, hiding true identity in the face of homophobia, which many adolescents face, and hiding true identity in the context of hate. Inhibitory factors in teen adjustment include stereotypes, jokes, bashing, politicized religiosity, and ongoing public debate about homosexuality. These factors can result in inhibition of positive identity formation and ongoing risks of disclosure. Gay lesbian teen adjustment barriers include fear of being labeled, fear of rejection, fear of negative consequences, fear of being outed, fear of losing previously supportive relationships. Healthcare provider attributes that have been identified as fostering adjustment include our ability to be responsive, our openness, our use of gender neutral language, forming partnerships with adolescents, and advocating for healthy adjustment and adaptation as well as providing guidance for families and not the least of which would be health promotion. So teen adjustment includes daily decision making. How much can they share? With whom may they share safely? What is the personal meaning of negative reactions they might encounter? And what are the personal meanings of others' comments? Possible untoward outcomes can include ongoing confusion, feeling misunderstood, and internalized hostility and worry about the future. Parental adjustment. Parents often feel a myriad of emotions when an adolescent comes out. Parents attribute multiple personalized meanings to the child's identity. Their initial adjustment focus is on the parents' focus of their own emotions, which may result in distancing from the adolescent. Adolescents often don't understand the parents' need for time and guidance to adjust. Gay and lesbian youth often must rely on professionals rather than informal sources of support. The development of 
the youth's identity is contingent on competence of professionals and non-professionals within service delivery systems. Agencies must examine policies, procedures, and protocols to assure competency in serving all teens, including sexual minority teens. What teens say they need. This is from qualitative studies that have been done with gay and lesbian teens. <clears throat> Vulnerability versus empowerment. Vulnerability is often felt by LGBT teens. Sharing with professionals often occurs before sharing with others. The power is in the hands of the authority figures, particularly in foster care, and others finding out before they are ready creates a problem for the adolescent and can perpetuate fear of authority figures. In terms of stigmatization versus validation, professional responses should avoid implying stigma. A quote from one adolescent in the study, you grow up hearing all these negative comments about homosexuality and how bad it is. And so when you find yourself at night in the dark laying in bed thinking about and judging your own thoughts and how sick of a person you are and people if they really knew they wouldn't love you anymore. Stigmatization versus validation. Another teen said, there was nobody else out there like me. I felt like the odd person out, so I just did not want to share it because I thought I was kind of a freak. They assume you don't want to go play basketball because you're gay. They don't give you that option. Treat us like everyone else. We are no different. Individualizing competency. Professionals must be able to respond to each youth as an individual, not focusing only on their sexual orientation. Professionals reflect or describe back the, uni the youth's unique and positive traits to allow internalization of positive traits into the forming identity of the adolescent. An example from another teen who said, I told her that I was gay and that I was concerned about what people said about gay people. She said, don't you pay them any mind at all. They don't know you. You are a kind and caring young man and anybody who knows you will tell you that. Strength finding. In an atmosphere of hate and other challenges to identity, gay and lesbian youth can lose sight of positive attributes and strengths. This quote from one adolescent, she convinced me that I was okay. She was like, Tyrone, that's you. Whoever don't like it, oh well, that's one less person to worry about in the world. She made me feel like it's good to be gay and that I'm not ashamed of my sexuality. Normalizing. To feel understood that their feelings, concerns, and yearnings are normal and natural even when their feelings are inconsistent with others' views. She was great. We watched movies in youth group and a couple of weeks in a row she brought in queer movies like Holiday Heart and Boys Don't Cry. And then acceptance versus rejection. Rejection focuses on interactions between the adolescent and others. Open rejection examples include statements from the adolescent such as, after I told her I was gay, she ditched me for a hotline, an emergency hotline. I was mad about that. Another adolescent, I asked her if she knows what bisexual was and she says yes and I'm not going to discuss that with you. Some adolescents lost relationships entirely once they disclosed their sexual orientation. Acceptance versus rejection. Rejection avoidance. Rejection avoidance is related to efforts to organize one's life in order to minimize rejection, which is also related to integrating a negative identity. An adolescent said, if they knew the thoughts that you had in your head and you were attracted to other people, sometimes you're scared to come out because you don't want to experience the pain of rejection one more time. 
remaining open. Professionals avoid need to avoid traps of giving advice, sharing opinions, or ju judging the youth, not forcing discussions into assumed notions of what is occurring. This is an example from an adolescent. She cared about her kids and their interests and what was best for them. She listened and she didn't make judgments or make comments and wasn't mean. My other worker was just hardcore, ridiculed and judgmental. Supportive engagement. Remaining engaged with youth is a real and caring in a real and caring fashion is essential. Staying in the moment in the conversation and on track. An adolescent said, they have to be like true to you because a kid can tell if a person is just bullshitting you. Responsive exploration. Maintaining an open mind in order to explore new situations and feelings. Asking questions so youth can discover his or her own feelings rather than instructing. This is an example. One student said, my worker, she knew. When I told her I was gay, first she asked me why did I think that, and I told her all the reasons why I thought that, and she was fine with it. Adolescent practice recommendations become aware of one's own personal feelings, values, and anxieties. Ask open-ended questions. Use gender-neutral questions on assessment. Avoid probing detailed questions and promote a healthy dialogue with the adolescent. Also use a psychoeducational approach when providing guidance. Referral options, counseling in practice, individual psychotherapy when indicated, seeing parents for separate therapy if they're having difficulty adjusting, consider family therapy, once the family is ready for that, and avoid pathologizing orientation when making a referral out. Mm -hmm.